Today is Tuesday, June 19, 2012. My name is Mark DePew, the Director of Oral History with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, and I'm just north of Cooksville, Illinois today talking to Scott Schertz. Good afternoon, Scott. Hello. You can tell by the background here that we're going to be talking about aircraft, but in this case we're going to be talking about aerial application. Scott is the, you're the president and owner of Schertz Aerial Services Incorporated, is that right? That is correct, yes. And before I get any further, there's one curiosity I want to clear up right from the front. I kept saying, boy, I'd love to do an interview with a crop duster. And I was quickly corrected. <laughs> I'm not familiar, or I don't care much for that term. We prefer the aerial application. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about why that's not a good term to be using? Well, that is a uh, symbol of the past, and uh, in fact, we don't even do d dust anymore. There are some dry products we do, but the dust is really a reference to the early years of this industry in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. So you have to fight that all the time with the general public, I would guess. Oh, yes. Uh, it's. Um, Interesting at times when people ask me what I do and I explain it, they're like, oh, a crop tester, and I'm like, no, I, I don't care much about that. Okay, well, now that we got that, that out of the way here, tell us a little bit about your background, when and where you were born. Um, I was actually born in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, my father at that time was a, um, in the retail fertilizer business, and uh, both my parents are from nearby central Illinois. And prior to that, he had been a Navy pilot and um, um, had grown up on a farm. So really the background is this area and farming and then with the... Um, What's the date you were born? Uh, July 15th, 1961. You said your father was a Navy pilot. Was um, he flying during the Korean War or after that time frame? He entered the Navy during the Korean War. That was what prompted him to enter or enlist in the Navy. And then he was in active duty um, through most of the 50s after that. And he was trained to do the aircraft land, aircraft carrier landings the whole bit? Yes, he was. And actually, the majority of the time he was in, he was an instructor pilot for the Navy in Florida. Did he know how to fly before he got to the Navy? No, he did not. Okay. Your story is a little bit different. I think you got into flying at a pretty early age, didn't you? Well, I grew up around his flying, and um, actually he had got into the aerial application business um, when I was eight years old. And uh, so I grew up, a lot of my time was around the ag airplanes and his operation of it. And what was his business before that time? Uh, it was actually Church Agricultural Service. It was a retail ground fertilizer and chemical business at El Paso, Illinois. So he was able to marry his business with the thing that he loved about the Navy, huh? Yes. Yes, um, Dad really enjoyed the flying part of it. What's your mom think about that move? Do you remember? Uh, I think she was a little bit um, concerned about that. Anything else we need to know about your mother and her contributions to your interest today? Well, um, actually, she has been quite involved up until the last few years with the business, both when Dad had it and then also when I had it. And, um, you know, she's been quite involved and has done a lot of the organization and invoicing and, and work with the business up until, like I said, about five years ago. Okay. Back during the time you were growing up, were you living in this area or? Uh, close to here, um, between Bloomington and El Paso. Were you growing up on the farm then? Uh, it was, yeah, what I would call a small farm, yes. How big was that? Uh, it was 40 acres there, and I had, you know, some of the typical 4-H projects, et cetera, there, but it wasn't a, you know, regular commercial farm, really. Okay. But you had a few of the farm chores as well? Oh, yes. Remember any of your 4-H projects growing up? Yes, actually the main part of it is I had sheep as my 4-H project, actually. So, okay. Yeah. Well, you've come a long way from sheep, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. When did you uh, start flying? Well, I soloed one on my 16th birthday. That's sort of one of the defining points. Obviously, I had flown with my dad some and then really started taking lessons 
Um, shortly before I was 16, I was able to solo on my 16th birthday. When he first got into the aerial application business, was this basically a one-man operation? He was the pilot, he owned the aircraft, and that was the extent of the business? Well, nearly so. Um, it would take someone to load to keep things going and to move the equipment around so he could work out of different places. So usually there was a ground guy or two, and, and obviously you still have to get the invoices out and do the, you know, that part of it also. But that was obviously the main part of it was the one man and one airplane. So when you soloed, were you soloing in your dad's aircraft? No, these um, are not training airplanes. Um, so <laughs> even no. back in those days? Even back in those days, no. Okay. Yeah, this is about room for one, and that's it, huh? <laughs> yes. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about your high school years then. Uh, did you have any other jobs during that time frame? Uh, yes, actually I did. Um, I worked for one of the neighboring uh, grain and livestock farms. And in addition to, I um, worked for Dad in the summertime, you know, loading the airplanes and that sort of thing. But, um, yes, it was a large um, actual grain and um, swine operation. So lots of equipment running and, and livestock stuff during my high school years. During those years, were you too young to be actually going out and flying and earning a living as an aerial applicator though? Well, that is correct. Um, you do have to have a commercial license and some other requirements too, but on the flying part of it, you have to have a commercial license, which you have to be at least 18 to have that. Okay. What were your goals then while you were in high school? What did you see yourself doing for a living? This is what I wanted to do. And um, honestly, a lot of the reason why I worked so much at that grain farm was to um, have the resources to hire the instruction and learn how to fly. It, it was very much combined with, with the expenses for learning how to fly. You were paying for your own uh, flight lessons then? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's your dad think about you following in his footsteps? Um, that's a good question. Um, dad um, was probably the typical parent in this business that maybe he really liked the idea of it, but he was also concerned about it. And uh, he really wanted it to be my decision and he didn't want to, you know, press me into it by any means. And um, I would say, if anything, it was more caution than encouragement. How about your mother? Uh, even more so. <laughs> more caution and less encouragement, huh? Yes. Okay. That doesn't sound unusual at all. No. Uh, you went to college then. Where'd you go to college? Yes, I went to undergrad at um, SIUC at um, Carbondale. And why Carbondale? Actually, at the time, they had one of the best uh, aviation programs in the Midwest, probably in the country, and um, it was, well, that was really the main driver was because of their aviation program. You said at the time. Is that no longer the case? Uh, actually, I think it is still right up there, but I can't say that I'm really current on, on all the college rankings. Your major? Uh, it was aviation technology and then finished off with um, ag business to make a bachelor's degree. In other words, you wanted to get into the business but also be able to eventually become an owner or operator at that level as well? Yes, I mean, this is what I had hoped to do. And obviously, these airplanes take a lot of maintenance. And um, it is a big advantage to be able to do it and also be able to understand what's going on, even if you aren't actively doing it all. And actually, at that time, even like the um, uh, other people in school with me that were on the airline track, they, that was very um, favored on at that time that even the airline pilots also had the aviation maintenance backgrounds as far as the training. Was the military every part of their equation? I know they got a big Navy, or Air Force ROTC at Southern. Um, honestly, I don't have the eyes for it. You have, at that time, anyway, you had to have um, uncorrected vision, and I do have to have contacts or eyeglasses, too. 
Okay, so you're wearing your contacts now. Yes, I am. Otherwise, you might have been interested? Yes. Okay. Well, if nothing else, they sometimes help pay for your schooling, and you mentioned you had to pay for your own flight lessons. How did you work your way through college? Um, I have to be upfront. Uh, my parents supported that. Yes. Were you, did you have a job in the summer? Uh, actually, I worked during college as a flight instructor for most of it, and somewhat a charter pilot while at college. What kind of a pilot? Charter pilot. Okay. And then uh, the last summer, I did start doing this type of work that I explained the last summer of college. Aerial applications. Yes. What does it take to get a commercial license then? Um, basically, it is uh, 250 hours, and then there's some qualifications for number of hours across country and night and instrument, et cetera, and um, um, proficiency on what they call the commercial maneuvers. But it's basically the hour requirement and a written test and a oral practical test with an examiner. So practically, you had to have your your own pilot's license long enough to be able to get to that 250 hour threshold? That is correct and then also um, along the way I got the instrument license and the flight instructor's license and um, I had around 1100 hours of total flying time when I started spraying which I think is really a minimal threshold. It isn't just getting a commercial license, you, you need a little more knowledge than that. Okay. Is there any, at that time, was there any special licensing or training that you needed to do this job that would be different from other commercial license applications? Yes, actually, the other big part of this is the um, FAA authorization to do this. This is under their Part 137 rules, and basically there has to be a certificate holder, of which at that time my dad was. and. You know, basically, he would have to sign a letter saying that I can do this and fall under that certificate. Okay. What year did you graduate from college then? Let's see. I graduated in 82. Um, 1982. And did you find a job right out of college? <laughs> well, I was spraying within a few days, yes. And then also um, the first few winters, I um, worked for Brit Airways as an aircraft mechanic in the winter times. Where was that? That was actually at Bloomington. They had a um, heavy maintenance base at the Bloomington Airport. Were you flying then for your father during this time frame? Mm -hmm. Yes. But you, you, the way you said that, it's, it's obvious this is a very seasonal business that you're in. Well, the operational part of it is. However, it's grown to be much more than that. And um, at that time, you know, you take care of the airplanes and work on them in the off season, and you did have more free time, whereas now there's a lot more going on. Was it typical during those days that uh, a young kid who would be flying in the summertime would have a different job in the winter then? Yes, uh, a lot of the other people I know of in this business, they either farmed or drove trucks or had something else going on. Yes. How was the payback then? Um, it um, was comparable to what a lot of the other college grads got. And maybe I had to be a little more innovative on in putting some things together, but I, it worked out fine. I imagine a lot of your classmates who had this, this vision of going into commercial aviation and flying the big airliners were, had big dollar signs in front of them as well. Was that, would that have been right at that time? Well, they had visions of that, but even the people that had the visions of that, there was typically a career path that took them through regional airliners and charter work and flight instruction, et cetera, that meant it was some delayed gratification. There. <laughs> That's a good way of saying it. So your path wasn't much different from theirs in that respect? Uh, it was probably similar, yes. In the summertime when you're actually doing this, how much uh, as a pilot, how much time are you spending in the cockpit actually doing the job? Uh, in July and August, a lot of it's 12 and to 16 hour days. Were there some limits at that time or now about how many hours you can fly per day? Well, that time it was until my dad thought I'd had enough. <laughs> 
And that was 12 to 16 hours, huh? Yes, but there were a few days that it wasn't that much. And I mean, that's appropriate. Did you get married somewhere along this timeline we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes, in 1983. Okay, and your wife's name? Kim. Kim, her maiden name was Scott? Ashley Scott, yes. Okay. okay. She knew the business you were in and the future that you had. What'd she think about it at the time you guys got married? Um, she didn't have a problem with it. Um, okay. Did you do some uh, charter work as well after you graduated? That is correct. Um, basically, after I was done doing the um, mechanical work for Brit Airways, I ended up flying the next few winters for uh, at that time, it was Clark Aviation, which was at Bloomington, and did charter work for them for three or four winters, and a little bit in the summer, but not much. What kind of aircraft were you flying then? It was mostly light twins. Okay. And that moved you away from the aviation maintenance side of the business? Mm, well, as far as the wintertime job it did. Obviously, I was still doing the maintenance work on the ag planes at that time. But it was always in the back of your mind? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like it was in the back of your mind. The main thing I want to do is this avi aerial application business. Is that, that right? That is correct, yes. Why that over the charter flights and over the maintenance side of the business? Um, maintenance is a useful skill, but honestly, I don't care that much for working on things for the sake of working on them. Um, the charter work, some of the equipment was neat, um, but the reality of it is you would um, fly somewhere, sit around all day, wait till someone else was ready to come back, and then fly back. And um, I don't care that much for the waiting of it. Um, and I think the aerial application side of it is doing something very worthwhile and we're helping to grow safe, abundant food. So I, I take a lot more satisfaction out of protecting and enhancing crops than transporting people. Well, speaking as one of those 99.9% .9 of the American population who, who's experienced with uh, what you do is watching you guys along the roadside and thinking, boy, that looks like a lot of fun. Uh, is it an exciting and a, a thrilling job to do as well? A lot of satisfaction in that respect? Um, I don't feel it that way. It's a lot of work. You have to have great attention to detail. And um, yes, at times the planes are very enjoyable. They maneuver well, but um, it is a serious business and you, you have to do it right and pay attention to the obstacles and, and the people around you. What, if you could describe the personality or the character traits of somebody who would make the perfect aerial applicator, what would that be? Oh, let's say generally calm but um, able to you know, pay attention to the necessary things. Uh, I would say a lot of the people that get into this end up coming out of more out of agriculture and or trucking than they do from you know big city or you know airliner type operations. Okay, well it's curious. I have this image in my mind of your Navy aviator as well, and maybe it's the calm part that doesn't necessarily fit in my own mind with what you would describe as your typical Navy aviator who likes to fly by the seat of his pants and does something very dangerous. It's, that's not the case in your business? Well, I don't think you're looking at what a naval aviator really was. I mean, obviously they liked some adventure of it, but there again, it's very demanding and they had to approach the carriers right and fly that equipment very right and very seriously. So. Um, the image doesn't always match up to the reality, I guess is what so I would say. Not easily excitable. Yes. Okay, very good. 1986, I think, was a big year for your life and career. What happened then? Uh, that is when I ended up purchasing um, the assets that became Church Aerial Service. And it sounds like that had been a goal of yours for quite some time. Uh, what was it about 1986 that gave you that opportunity? Um, 
it was a time that my dad felt he needed to transfer it, basically. What did the business consist of at that time then? At that time, the business consisted of um, three ag cats, which were the radio engine biplanes and uh, several pickup trucks and small trailers. It was really the main assets of the business at that time. Was it strictly aerial application? Yes, it was. Okay. How many uh, employees did, did you have to begin with? Oh, at that time, it was probably up to about five. And of course, you know, maybe three of those were summertime only, but. And you said how many aircraft again? Three. Okay. Was that the number that you had working during the summer as well, or did you want to lease some? Uh, at that time, typically, if there was a situation where we couldn't use them or had the need to, we'd get up to around six airplanes. A couple years prior to that, we had had a year like that, and then a couple years after I bought it, we had a situation where I ended up running around six or eight airplanes. So we're talking uh, 2012. How many years is that? That's quite a long time to be in this business, I would think. Yes, it is. Well, um, I think my son had put the math together last year and said, oh, it's 25 years for you in this, so I guess it's 26 or so now. How has the business grown since you took over? The, um, a lot of the growth of this business is related to the, um, the enhanced capabilities of these products to um, increase yields. In particular, the strobin fungicides have um, shown to tremendously help the production of the food and um, make it something that people more plan on our operations as opposed in the early years it was really in a sense waiting for a insect infestations to have a lot of work to do. I suspect, suspect that the general public would also be surprised at the variety of different products that you uh, are able to disperse. Can you kind of run down what those would be quickly? Well, the broad they, categories at least? <laughs> sure, we do everything from um, fertilizing crops to um, herbicides, um, protecting crops from weeds, uh, obviously insecticides and fungicides. And then another thing that um, we do a lot of that's actually growing considerably is the cover crop seeding in the fall of the year. Is that something that's growing in popularity even in a place like central Illinois where most of the fields lay fallow for the, for the winter time? Yes, actually it is because it is a way of managing um, erosions, erosion and nutrients and um, that is something that is increasing about the last three years, maybe 50 percent or so a year. It, it is a, a lot of increase on that. Is that a good way to fix some nitrogen in the soil versus the old-fashioned fertilizing ways? Well, you're mixing a couple different things. Um, it may retain some fertilizer that would all otherwise possibly wash off, but it doesn't make any fertilizer or very little. It doesn't fix any nitrogen in the soil then? Uh, the majority of these crops do not. I mean, when you do a grass, it isn't going to fix it. Okay. Uh, and the radishes are not a legume. Um, there is one version of this that has some clover, and on that you are correct that the clover could put some nitrogen into it. But um, generally it's more of a nutrient capture than a nutrient fixing program. Okay. At the time you started, what was the geographical spread of your customer base? Um, actually, it was similar. I mean, it was um, central Illinois within maybe 30, 40 miles of Bloomington was the majority of it, and stronger to the east, but, but yeah, it was very similar. We've expanded a little bit, but... Um, Still basically the same geographic boundaries? Uh, I've tried to push them a little bit, yeah, but, um, but it is still centered around the same area. Yes. When we met before, you mentioned that your operation is licensed not just in Illinois, but some other states as well. That is correct. Occasionally I have worked other places and um, I worked everywhere from northern Minnesota to um, all the Delta in Arkansas and um, 
out west into um, the Cap Rock of Texas. So yes, I've worked around quite a few different places. But you're not the only aerial applicator out there. Why would you go that far afield? Is there something that unique or special that your operation does? No, but the reality of this is there's either too many or not enough airplanes at any given one spot. And um, obviously these are seasonally used pieces of equipment. And if you can locate the work to keep them busy longer, it, it is a help. So um, it, it was worthwhile to do on basically keeping the airplanes busy longer. Was there a challenge that you found taking over the business back in 1986 and during this long time frame you've been in operation that, that maybe uh, the biggest challenge or the one that surprised you the most? Hmm. The biggest challenge, what surprised me the most? Well, I think probably the biggest thing is you just have to keep at it. <laughs> and, um, you know, you try to be considerate of other people's interests and run it accordingly. But um, primarily, I would say the persistence is the biggest thing. That many times there's situations where you can't, you know, work in, but then you keep after it, and, and eventually you'll get there. Did you find an opportunity to go back to school? Yes, I did end up going back um, in the let's see, it would have been early '90s to um, get my MBA at Illinois State and finish that up in the um, mid '90s. And that was, had a direct application to what you were doing then? Well, at the time, that wasn't what I thought. But um, as it has turned out, it has been a huge benefit. The other thing that impressed me when we first met was the number of organizations that you are now involved in. And let's start off with the National Agricultural Aviation Association. Tell me about that organization. Well, that is the National um, Trade Association for Agricultural Aviation. And um, I first knew of it from being part of the Illinois Agricultural Aviation Association. And uh, actually my real introduction to it was when I selected for the um, Zeneca Leadership Program. And um, then ended up having the opportunity to be on the board and um, be, end up going through their um, leadership cycle, including the president, in um, 2005. You were president of this organization, a national organization? Yes. I'm assuming this is more than just an honorary kind of position. No, it is really being on the hot seat for a year. Hot seat with who? Well, um, you know, you're the media contact, and, you know, you end up being in on congressional hearings and meetings with the EPA and go around to many of the state associations and basically tell them what the interpoi is doing for them for the year. Well, this isn't a question of ignorance from my part again, but agricultural aviation, is that one and the same as aerial application or is it larger than that? Well, actually aerial application, if you really want the definition of it, includes public health and um, other aspects. Ag is really the farming aspect of it, where aerial application is broader and, and there are, you know, occasionally um, well, public health so says mosquitoes that do require aerial application to control them, for example. Okay. And I know from in 2002 you joined the Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association? Um, actually, I was, uh, I've been uh, a member of that for quite some time, but I was a board member of that um, from roughly then to last couple of years. But yes, I was a, a um, board member for the IFCA. And tell us about your involvement with EPA that continues today, I believe. Yes, um, as a result of being the NAAA president, at least how I would describe it, I ended up getting asked to be a, on a work group on um, pesticide policy with the US EPA. And um, started in 2006. And um, that has developed into actually being a member of the Federal Advisory Committee, a full member of that. 
called the Public Pesticide Dialogue Committee, the PPDC. And it is a um, group of very broad stakeholders that advise the U.S. EPA on pesticide policy. Does that mean there's people out there in the, the uh, aerial application community that are calling you up and says, hey, you got to help us out here. They're killing us, or, or words to that effect. Um, I, there are some people in this industry that understand what I'm doing. And uh, yes, a lot of times they will let their views known. But you also have to realize that's a very big table there. Um, there's roughly 45 or 50 people on it. And the um, ag aviation industry, I'm the only one representing that really on it. So it's a much broader issue than just agricultural aviation, although regularly there are agricultural aviation components to it. But you said this is particularly for the, the committee or the issue you're working on is particularly about pesticides? Yes. But I would think that was overwhelmingly had an agricultural theme to it, though. Um, the pesticides, it's similar to what I talked about on the um, ag versus aerial application. Okay. There so are mosquito control and things like there that. There are public health I know, structural pest control, I mean like termites, for instance. And actually all this stuff comes under what is called FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide Fungicide Rodenticide Act. So it is broader than, quote, ag pesticides. And um, many of these, or these products have a very lengthy approval registration process and re-registration and basically all the aspects of the use, registration, testing, standards, et cetera, actually come before this committee. Are you getting paid for any of this work? Mm, not directly, no. Not correctly? You not said? directly, no. Not directly. So uh, are you getting reimbursed for your travel expenses? The direct travel expenses for the actual FACA meetings, yes, the federal government does reimburse me for that. However, that's about 10% of the time I'm in D.C. So what are the advantages for you, a very active businessman with plenty of challenges back here, to be involved with this? Well, there's two real parts to it. One is around those big tables of experts, there needs to be someone with some sense of reality of what actually happens and um, understands that you, you know, need to use these products correctly and courtesy, and with courtesy. And um, many times the academia types that are there have no practical experience. So there are many worthwhile things that a little bit of practical insight can help. Uh, but from a personal standpoint, the biggest thing is I do end up learning more about the issues and it has actually benefited this business immensely on things that I've learned from being out there and uh, the different issues I've seen have had a direct impact on this business in a positive way. Okay. We're sitting in what is relatively a new facility, right? That is correct. When did you build this? This particular building, uh, we started building about two years ago now, and we actually moved into the office that you came in through about four months ago. So it was about a year and a half project actually to build it. We had got to start using this hangar about a year ago, but obviously the office part of it took a while longer. Your business then has grown quite a bit since 1986. Yes, it has. How many employees do you have now? Um, year round, it's approximately eight, and then at the peak, it'll be approximately 50 people here in about two weeks. And how many aircraft do you own? I own four ag planes, the air tractors behind us, and then I actually have one Cessna 182 also. Do you rent any more in the peak seasons? I will either lease or subcontract additional ones, yes. How many in the peak seasons, I guess it would be July and August, and how many aircraft would you have operating at that time? Would Ideally, you'd want to have operating. Oh, 12 to 15. 
It's quite a bit. Yes, that's a lot of pieces to um, keep in place, yes. Okay, well this might be an unusual question for, from, from your perspective, but why aerial application? Why can't you find other ways to apply all these products that, that the public would know about? Well, obviously we do a, a portion of it. It's about 25% of all the products actually go on by air for some very good reasons. And basically they are that we can get across the field quickly without damaging the crop and at a time when typically the crops would be damaged by running through them. Is there a different kind of terrain that's better for aerial application than the standard application procedures? Well, obviously the fewer obstructions help. Uh, bigger fields and fewer obstructions um, are more efficient to do, yes. How about uh, hilly terrain? Is it better or worse for, from your perspective? Uh, it depends how hilly you're talking about. I mean, you can handle some rolls just fine, but there are basically limits on how much you can keep to the proper application height, dependent on how rolling the ground is. Or Would you say your business, that 25%, has that grown over the last 25 years you've been involved with the industry? I would say it has, um, but those are, you know, national statistics as far as the you know, crop protection market that is serviced by airplanes is sort of approximately 25 percent. Is that, do you think there's room for growth in that percentage? Yes, I think so. Okay. Um, I would think that this is an expensive way to, to apply. Is that not the case? I mean, some of these other machines that do the application are awfully expensive as well. That is, well, you're hitting on some good points. Um, Yes, these are expensive airplanes, however, they can cover a lot of ground, so basically you can spread their cost out over a, a lot of operations. Um, they are very versatile, and uh, many of the ag equipment pieces are pretty um, discreet as far as they can do one thing well, and these are actually pretty versatile. Okay. In this area of the country, we're talking overwhelmingly soybeans and corn. That is correct. And yes. if that's what your applications are applied to? Um, a high percentage, yes. Um, there are a few other crops around here. We do a little alfalfa. We do some sunflowers. Um, but, but yes, the majority is corn and soybeans. Scott, I wonder if you can kind of walk us through a typical season. You start with applying one product and you end with applying another product and what's in between there in the time frames. Okay, um, the typical season starts out in February, usually on top dressing wheat with fertilizer, with nitrogen fertilizers. And then um, typically there are a few insects in the alfalfa in uh, late April or May, about the same time that a lot of that wheat that we had put the fertilizer on would benefit from a fungicide. So those are the main things up through May, unless it is a real wet year. And those times when we may do a lot of herbicide work. But generally it's the wheat fungicide work and then we get into um, June and right now we are doing some fertilizer on corn actually. And then the insecticide and fungicide season usually starts about the 4th of July and goes to about Labor Day. And that's the insecticides and fungicides on corn and beans. And then it usually ends up with um, the cover crop seeding in late August and September. And then it's time for a breather, huh? Well, and then it's back to maintaining equipment and positioning things for another year and lots of trips to D.C. Okay. You mentioned before at, at the very beginning of this that the reason crop dusting doesn't work for one reason is it's not dust anymore. That is correct. I assume you've got though both solids and liquids that you're dispensing? That is correct. How does that break out in various products that you've got? Uh, probably 95% of what we do is liquid. 
um, and roughly 5% would be the fertilizer and seeding that we do. So the fertilizer and is solid that you're dropping pellets? Uh, it's actually called prills, but yes, it is a um, typically about a BB size particle, a little bit smaller than that, but it's a dense, basically, BB side particle. Is one reason for that is it's just not going to be picked up by the wind as easily? It's a little bit heavier? Yes, and it's actually a part of the actual manufacturing process, how they make it. That um, That's how it forms when it comes out of the process. And I think generally it's probably made that way more for ease of handling and ease of ground application, and it works fine through the aircraft also. For those who are listening closely to this uh, audio track, there's a little bit of a creaking of the, the building, but it's a gorgeous day. There's you know, a typical wind, I guess, out there. What's, what's the ideal conditions that you would want to have, and what's the limits that you can work with? Um, the ideal circumstances for the spraying probably is 5 to 12 mile an hour wind, or 3 to 12 mile an hour wind. Um, the limits are probably 17, 18 mile an hour for spraying. The, um, like the dry fertilizer, we can probably go up to 20 mile an hour wind or so on that. But um, you do have to be mindful of what's around you. and. Um, the wind isn't always a problem. Many times we use that to make sure the product does not move towards a sensitive side. Rain, you're shut down? Yes, uh, the visibility gets very bad and the majority of these products, um, people want them to be active on the plants for a certain period of time prior to a rain or to be absorbed by or be active. Okay, so a lot of the cases, you're applying especially the liquid, then it's, it's to direct application of the plants themselves and it's not to the soil. That is correct, yes. Okay, so the plant can much more quickly absorb whatever well, the either, qualities are? Well, either absorb or be protected by it, depending on what okay. type of chemistry. Has the uh, fungicide side of the business, is that something that's grown since the time you started? Yes. Um, when I was first around it and first had it, it was primarily a occasional thing for some of the specialty crops, maybe the seed corn or sweet corn, something like that. And um, by the new strobin technology over roughly the last five years, it um, directly benefits many of the corn and soybean yields. Is there any other product that have, you've seen a lot of growth in the use and the development of? Mm, that's probably the most striking example. I mentioned the cover crop increase also. I'd say those are really the, the two main real growth okay. points. We're going to, after this uh, session is over, we're going to walk around and look a little bit more closely at the aircraft, but can you tell us a little bit about the aircraft that you do use, just to, as an introduction? Sure. Um, what I've got are turbine air tractors. They're um, made in Olney, Texas. They were designed by a man by the name of Leland Snow. And um, these are all specially designed for agricultural aviation. And um, they're all powered by turboprops. Basically, it is a jet engine that um, um, ends up running the propeller, commonly known as a turboprop. But, um, but yes, they are um, specially designed for this work, and he made a lifetime of designing and refining his design of, of um, ag planes. Speed isn't necessarily what you want, is it? Oh, speed's generally a good thing in an airplane. Okay, even in these, where I would think that they'd be going a little bit slower than than if you're doing charter aviation, for well, example. Well, yes, but um, on these, basically, we uh, they perform the best at about 150 mile an hour. Okay, and retractable wheels, or they're fixed? No, they are fixed. Okay, so drag isn't an issue like it would be for other aircraft. Well, drag. Um, isn't as much of an issue. I mean, you really want to be at a correct working speed, and actually the nozzle setups are d dictated based on the speed you operate, et cetera. What would be the optimal speed when you're actually applying? 
Um, on the ones behind us, that 140, 150 mile an hour is, is where you want to be. Okay. And we're going to hopefully get some action shots and we can talk more about the art of flying in these fields and applying in, in the future here. I did want to ask you though, I noticed that helicopters are oftentimes used as well. What's the difference between using helicopters and fixed wings like you've got? The big thing is that they um, have even more moving parts and my understanding are that they are more expensive to maintain and more um, both in time and, and expense and the market share is probably something like 98 percent fixed wing and two or three percent um, rotary wing there aren't very many helicopters in the state are there some applications where the helicopter just works better probably <laughs> but not for you not for me no thanks okay is your business now strictly aerial application or have you expanded beyond that it's strictly aerial application yes. and, and retail the products that we put out through the airplane. Okay, so. so you do a little bit of the retail business. Well, everything we do is retail, though. Okay. But are you selling to other aerial applicators or other no. farmers who are applying no. it in traditional? We, we sell it through the application of the airplanes. Okay. Well, I don't need to tell you that the United States for the last several years has gone through some very tough economic times. Has any of that affected your business? Um, the changes in fuel costs related to that, yes, that has impacted our business. Um, but generally, the last several years have been high demand for ag commodities, which have been a support for this business. Which goes right back to the overall equation of availability of fuel because ethanol production has increased corn prices quite a bit. So that's helped your business? Yes, that is true. Okay. Um, let's get beyond the, the flying aspects a little bit. Tell us about the maintenance side. How many people does it take to maintain these aircraft for you? Um, actually, there's pretty much two people that spend most of the winter working on the airplanes and the trucks, et cetera. And um, we are licensed to do that. Uh, it takes an inspection authorization to do the annual inspections. And um, yes, it is a, a detailed project to go through and um, check things over for another year. Do you have your own routine every time you uh before you jump into the cockpit? Yes, I do. You know, there are certain things that I'll check and as a part of the pre-flight, yes. What would those be? Uh, typically that um, things such as cotter pins and um, um, are in on the uh, control surfaces that there's no apparent damage of a truck or something running into it and that the fuel caps are on and the tires are in good shape and the brakes are in good shape and the oil cap is in place. I mean, those are basically what it amounts to that you're checking that there's no damage or deterioration of the control controls. How much of your time is spent on marketing and managing the staff? Um, sometimes more than I'd like. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have a business if you don't do those things. Huh? That is correct, but I do have a good staff and generally I don't have to do a lot of it. Is there somebody who helps with the marketing on the staff? Um, yes, um, let's see, Heather Pearson and Jeff Dallahan do a lot of it and my main office manager, Kay Richard, is involved in all aspects of it, including that. Do you do some advertising for the business? We do some select advertising, yes. But I think in this business it is more effective the um, conversations and making direct calls than, than just having a, say, a billboard or a radio ad. Going. And the farmer sitting in the, in the uh, coffee shop in December talking about what they do, huh? Well, I'm not a real fan of the coffee shops for farmers. I really like the uh, tool shed conversations with them about it. Okay, great. Um, I want to get into some uh, safety issues here for you. 
And again, here's something that the public perception would say, this is an inherently dangerous business. Would that be accurate? That hasn't been my experience with them. Okay. So the public is just wrong on that? Well, the public probably doesn't understand the care, attention to detail that we do take in doing this. And um, I mean, obviously you have to do it right, but it just has not been my experience of, of um, you know, damaging things or damaging these that you, you, you can do it safely. Okay, I wanna run through a few of the things that at least according to trade magazines are some of the risks that are rated highest among your, your fellow pilots out there. Mm -hmm. Power lines, communication towers, and meteorological towers. Yes, well, you have to miss those things. <laughs> and um, the power lines are nearly always present. The big thing is understanding where they are and where they aren't and anticipating them, knowing how to read the power lines as far as what's going on, that's huge. Um, some of the bigger ones I can work under, which I routinely do. And um, that's sort of a unique thing to actually, you know, work airplanes routinely underneath power lines, but we, we do that where it fits. Um, the communication towers, obviously there's quite a few, particularly cell towers, et cetera, along the interstates, and they t tend to be freestanding structures that um, you, you know, have to watch out for, but they don't tend to have a lot of guy wires. The MET towers are probably the biggest risk. They are very hard to see. They're in the middle of farm fields. They have thin guy wires. They move around a lot. They're not static locations. Actually, one of the um, women that work for me, that's one of her assignments is to track these things, and we actively track about 300 of them in our trade area. Does that mean that before you go up in any job, you are looking at a map to see where all the hazards might be? Well, actually we have a software that if we put the hazard on it, then it shows up in the field map so we can see it by looking at that as, and we can verify it when, then when we get to the field. But it actually shows up on our, our the map we take to the plane. I know GPS had a huge impact on just your average farmer because they know exactly where they're at in the field and where the applications need to go. Is that the same way it works for you? Very similar, yes. Actually, the um, GPS and ag started out in ag planes before they were in ground equipment, actually. It, it started in ag planes. And yes, we do use what's called shape files where um, basically it'll a map can be drawn that has the lat long coordinates with it and it will go into our GPS guidance and actually guidance to the field and then show us the actual block to spray. Do you have to go through the routine of filing flight plans? No. Is that just because you're not located at a major airport? No, it's because of the type of operation. I mean, when I, if I fly to DC myself, for instance, I'll fly an instrument flight plan. And, and yes, I do use, know how to use the system. I will when it fits. But basically, you're out of radar contact low. You're not, the reason for a flight plan is either to um, track you and provide separation in a controlled environment. And basically, the low altitude stuff is not that. So it, it is isn't appropriate. Mm -hmm. There's been a proliferation of wind turbines over the last decade or so. Is that any more significant a challenge than some of these other hazards that you've had? Yes, it's right up there too. Um, they are very difficult to work around and um, you just have to plan things out very well. It isn't so much the ones in the field you're spraying, but the ones you have to turn around at the end of the field. So um, yes, it does take time, and many times if it's a, just a little bit on the windy side, they really beat the air up, and it's rough working around them too. How about bird strikes? Um, yes, occasionally we'll hit a bird. I mean, there's no doubt about that, but um, that's a 
relatively rare occurrence. The worst I've ever seen for damage out of it may have been a cracked windshield, not much different than what you would have seen in a car. Okay. And you're working with a lot of different chemicals as well. Are there any inherent risks or hazards dealing with those? Well, basically you want to handle them correctly and wear the proper protective equipment for loading and mixing. And actually we use closed mixing equipment for the most part. And that has reduced exposure and been a huge help. Okay. Scott, have you had any close calls? Oh, uh, I have got a few power lines over my time. And um, uh, let's see, I have had a couple of engine problems. Nothing that has actually put me down, but things that I knew I needed to soon. You said the power lines. Can you tell us what, can you paint us a picture? Maybe you're close in Connor with power lines? Oh, the majority of the ones I have got have been the strange angling ones where you thought they were coming out of a set of buildings, maybe at the end of the lane, and they actually cut across the corner of a field. So here you are trying to get in and to spray as much of the field as you, as you can, and oh gee, that power line cut across the corner as opposed to went out you know, with the lane to the road. When you or some of your other staff are talking to a farmer, do they sometimes tell you, hey, you got to watch out for this particular power line or this particular wire that might be out there? Uh, we like that, if particularly if there's changes or it's a particularly um, difficult situation. Um, by and large, so it, it ends up being our responsibility to read the situation and, and deal with it. Sometimes they're not as conscious as you would like them to be about those those challenges. Well, I think oftentimes they get complacent that they're used to seeing us work around them routinely and don't realize that, um, you know, this or that may be a real concern. Okay. Well, let's finish this part of the discussion then with a little bit of di talk about regulations that you deal with, because I would expect that your business is pretty heavily regulated. Let's start out with FAA issues and flights situations. Okay. Anything else that we need to know about? Well, that's a lot of it. The, um, obviously, we have to maintain the aircraft under the federal aviation rules. That is a regulatory requirement. Obviously, my pilot certification is under the FAA. And then also the um, FAR Part 137 certificate that I hold is a FAA um, certificate for allowing the low-level operations, and that's the majority of the sort of the umbrellas that we operate under. Okay. How about on these management and the storage of all these different chemicals that you're working with? Um, the State Department of Ag is what is called the state lead agency that is um, authorized by the US EPA to regulate that in this state. And yes, we do have the Department of Ag um, come by every year or two to verify that we're keeping the required records and have the proper diking and warehousing standards is. And this, a lot of this will now go back to all the things that you're involved with with the EPA and those discussions. But once you get to the actual point of, of applying them, I'm, I'm sure there's a whole host of concerns like water contamination, the water table, and um, you know you can probably list about 100 off the top of your head. Well, there are directions of use on these products called the label. And called what now? The label. And basically, they are the requirements for using them. And yes, that is actual EPA policy right there on on the use and the way to mitigate risk is on the label. So yes, we do have to comply with the label requirements. Are, are there some inherent um, built-in conflicts because farmers want to be able to use these applications for a whole host of reasons and environmentalists would like to see them shut down for their own reasons? Um, yes, there are definite conflicts on the policy side. Okay. Um, finish off with this question then for you. There's, I'm sure there's a part of the American public that loves the romance of the thing. 
And then I just alluded to the side of the American public who hates the environmental aspects of the thing. Any other reflections that you want to give us as we close with this session? Well, yes. I mean, these operations are to help grow safe and abundant food. And I mean, that's really what this is about, that you know, my position isn't so much about the airplanes, it's about helping food production. And, and we use modern agricultural tools to do that, including the airplane. Okay. Thank you very much, Scott. I think Thank the you. next part is the tour of the aircraft. Okay.